I've been in the antique business for 35 years, antique furniture. The new old tool, this is actually a tool that they used to use to do the gilding on desks on the leather tops. So this right here is a, heat, is a heated stick with a brass engraved and, an, and a mylar that actually gets rolled into the leather. That's an old hand tool that uses to pull a primer out of a shotgun shell. And the other side. That's how you put the primer in. So that's a dual tool. That's probably 100 years old or so. But just a hobby. And I ended up uh, just restoring, uh, stripping and refinishing uh, furniture. Been a woodworker all my life. Done some leather work. These are Sterling cycle engines. They were probably started manufacturing them back in the, in the 1870s. And they're not steam engines. Steam engine uses water. These use a small burner that runs on alcohol. They run on alcohol. It's gonna take about a minute or two minutes to heat up the, uh, the hot, hot air piston, which will push up, the hot air piston will push itself up and this cold, cold air piston here will push it back in. And the two will fight each other like this. And it will continuous run. They're called Sterling Cycles. These are models of the real ones. They're German models. This one here is a bigger one. That's an American model. There it goes. It'll actually pick up. It'll, have, it'll pick up pretty good speed. In a minute. This is what they call a, a a jack shaft. You could run another belt like that down onto. A, I got like a little tiny drill press. It would run a little drill press. It would run a little hammer. It would run all kinds of small attachments. Next year I'll screw it to a board and put all the atta attachments around it, so it'll be running stuff. But what we have here is a various display of red lines from 68 to 72. And these have become popular now because of eBay. People can literally go on eBay and look at their childhood and buy their childhood back. And now they know they're worth a lot of money. So everybody's come out with them and they're selling them on eBay or at Rietta or every, anywhere you go. And there's a various collection here of the old and the new and the different red line clubs and the neoclassic clubs and the different size scales and some of the cars here these are Tonka's trucks these are uh, in the 70s they were created to compete with Matchbox and Hot Wheel and uh, they were designed and built right in Clinton at Nipro Mold and the interesting thing about those cars is when they were setting the run up to compete with Hot Wheel and Matchbox the factory had some mechanical problems with the machinery to build these cars. So these are actually the first home assembled goods in the plastic industries in Clinton. So when I was a kid, we would go to my grandparents for daycare in the day during the summertime. And we went to my grandmother's one day and all these car parts were on the porch. And we spent the summer assembling these. So I forgot all about them until one day at Rietta, I found one. And I literally held one in my hand and I said, did I make this one? So ever since then, I've been trying to accumulate those. So I brought those with me today to draw some attention to them. But this is my passion. I, everybody collects something, and this is what I'm into. And I get some pleasure out of it. And every now and then, I set up a track, and we run a few down the track just for old time's sake. And I'm not the only one. You know, there's a few people that do the same thing. And 
I just brought them here today to show that everybody's into something different. And then there's a box on the table that means a lot to me, and that's a Transformers Hot Wheels set. And on the side of the box right here is my son Grady. And he was five years old when he filmed that box. And that's about 11 years old now because he's 16. And so I'm a Hot Wheels collector, and when he did the box set, they sent me a whole case of them. So how did he get on the box? He was modeling at the time. Oh. And uh, he got picked by Hasbro to do a whole series of ads for them, and this is one of the things he ended up in. So where I'm a Hot Wheel collector, that's like the prized possession of my Hot Wheels collection. In the case, there's one car that's pretty special. This Charger right here was actually reclaimed from my childhood. That was pink when I was a kid, and I didn't want a pink car when I was seven years old, so I painted it with a black Sharpie and I buried it in my sandbox. <laughs> Years later, the new owners of my old childhood home dug that up when they were rototill in the garden. And they gave it to my wife, who sent it away to a restoring company in California. And for $100, they put a new interior, new glass, new paint, new wheels, new tires. So that's literally come from the grave. <laughs> Wonderful. Is there a holy grail out there that you want? For yes, your there is. There's, this particular Volkswagen bus is called the Beach Bomb. And this is a side loader beach bomb. But there is a beach bomb that the surfboards load in through the back rear window. That is a Holy Grail car. That's what you're looking for. There is low numbers known in existence of that particular car. So that is the prize we're looking for every week at Rietta Ranch. Yet to be found, probably never will be found, but they're very low numbers of those cars available. Good luck on uh, finding that. And happy hunting to everybody out there, because now I know everybody else will be doing it, too. <laughs> you a Girl Scout? I see all those. I was here. a very enthusiastic Girl Scout. The day that I joined the Brownies was the proudest day in my life. And then I got to go and be a Girl Scout. And I have the five-year pin for the being at least five years. and. Of course, there's several badges, and I got the curved bar, which was the highest pin in scouting at the time. It's now been supplanted by the gold star. But this was a very happy time in my life. This is another full color pin from Italy. But as pins have gone down this century, they, you know, the years, they have gotten less and less expensive to produce because they usually are kept within the range of around $5. Now this is a pin that I don't separate from its backing. And you can see the backing is made for it. But the real fun comes when you turn it around. And this Mondrian influenced picture of a basketball court uh, is really fun. I got that at an art gallery in Worcester. The other thing I have is I have a vest. And the vest has a number of pins. They're all related to America, one way or another. And the vest itself is very special because it was made for me the night after 911, I was working at Boston Latin, and one of the teachers there actually went home after school, pulled an all nighter, and made a number of these. She adapted uh, vests, but she, she did a beautiful job. And even on the back, you can see that it's a very special vest. She had a few of these that she'd made for colleagues, and one for me. And the other thing uh, she had done was she made a great, huge American flag to put in her classroom because she never had one. So that was a very busy night for her and something for me to remember every time I wear it. I have been known to toss a real apple into the system somewhere uh, until my son so jeered at me because he could tell from across the room that it was a fake. I couldn't. But uh, no, none of these are edible or have anything edible about them that I know about. So why, how did you start collecting apples? 
I was at Lawson Farm in Concord, and one of the things they had was a display against a window of various objects that I don't remember and cobalt glass down there with a light behind it. And it, I looked at that and thought it was just wonderful. Cobalt glass really is wonderful. Sherry has a bunch of them. And I said to myself, if I collected apples, I'd have an excuse to buy that thing. So I decided on the spot that I collected apples and spent more money than I should have and took the cobalt glass apple home. So that's number one in the book here. This is a book that I keep a list of them in. Do you have a favorite? Uh, I, I mean, your cobalt is probably The cobalt favorite. glass is certainly one of them. Another favorite is, uh, I don't have it here because it has to dangle from something. It's a wire. Uh, my son bought it the year that he moved out of the house at a yard sale because he was frequenting yard sales a good deal. Um, and he proudly presented it to me on Mother's Day, which was the only time he ever spent money on a Mother's Day present. Declared that he had spent 50 cents for it <laughs> because he thought that was my style of Mother's Day present, and he was absolutely right. And it's, it hangs in a window with a uh, wind chime in it with very nice brass birds. So it's like birds in a cage. It's maybe this big. Uh, some time ago, I decided that the ultimate apple would be a gold apple. So that's what this is. Uh, it's very light. A sneeze would blow it off the table. It didn't cost much, from which I conclude that the gold is probably six molecules thick. Uh, but anyway, there it is. Uh, some of these probably go back to the days when uh, John Boynton was available to the town as a tinsmith. Um, those were called hog scrapers because once the candle had stick it outlived its value, you could scrape the hair off the hog with it. That's what they're called, hog scraper candlesticks. The picture is an artist's rendition of what we think the Baptist church would have looked like when it was at Baptist Common in Templeton. Uh, the church was moved from that location on Baptist Common to what is now Route 68 in Otter River, and then it was State Road, and then it was moved again to Baldwinville to be closer to the railroad and perhaps get more people to come to church. And during the hurricane of 1938, you'll see the photographs of the church before the hurricane, after the hurricane, and then after it was repaired in the late 30s, early 40s, uh, it was painted white and it was added on to, but that's what we think it looked like when it was in Baptist Common. Well, this is a cranberry glass collection and my husband and I bought this piece on our honeymoon as a souvenir and we both loved it and we got a lesson on it from the person, uh, the company that was selling it. And cranberry glass is made from 24 karat gold and lead crystal. So the gold is what makes it cranberry colored. So um, we've been married 40 years and we now have 43 pieces. You know, I looked online this morning and this size vase, almost exactly this vase, sold for $500. And I have two vases at home that are bigger than that. They're floor vases so uh, what company? It, these are all made from pilgrim glass they started out uh, making all colored glass but eventually the ruby glass the cranberry glass rather took over you know so I keep the labels on them so this is says pilgrim cranberry glass it's out of West Virginia and they did go out of business about 2001 so, um, you know, so actually these are very valuable now. And they were valuable when, when we bought them, <laughs> you know, one, one at a time. You know, a little tiny one like this, what costs $35, you know, and, and I have one that's worth $250, you know. But I didn't bring it. You know, my husband said that I shouldn't go home if, if I uh, break any. <laughs> 
but I use them, you know, for for diffusers, um, for candy, creamers, flowers, um, lights and candles. So it's utilitarian too. And, and a lovely addition to your home. Oh yes, we have the perfect place to display them. We have a, a vaulted ceiling, and we have a 20-foot shelf underneath the ceiling. So and we. Uh, put electricity on the shelf so we have all kinds of Christmas lights making these all sparkle. Well, it started with boxes, but it really ends up being treenware. Treen, treenware, T R E E N. And that's woodenware that has some utilitarian use or kitchen use. And most of these uh, boxes, which I started collecting because I love the shape of them, uh, most of the boxes had items in them. They either came with powders or herbs or gunpowder or gold leaf. One of these actually has the gold still in it. Or they came as uh, sewing boxes. Uh, some of them have uh, pencils. Uh, a lot of it had, to, had uh, women's items in it, hairpins and things like that. Ten years ago we moved from a large house to a smaller ranch house. And I had several collections, and last year, uh, so it would have been nine years, I had a collection of bells. I had about a hundred of those. And then this year, I said, well, let's do the treenware in the little boxes. I hunted all day yesterday, and it was only late last night that I found this box tucked behind things in the attic. So I've had a wonderful time today because I've opened up cardboard boxes and pulled out these little treasures and just rediscovered them again this morning. So it's been a joyous trip for me. Yeah. And so are some of these are collected by your parents and your husband's parents? No, these are all mine. Where did you find this? Where well, you antique them? stores and... Um, really? I never saw it. Well, like somebody said when they were, they did an appraisal of our house at one time and he said, well, there's no more treenware boxes out here. You own them all. So I did, that was a joke. <laughs> but I did, um, I did buy a lot of them. And some of the more interesting things, for example, this is one that I found last night. I started researching, uh, which I've never done before. But there are labels on a lot of these things. And this one is uh, a maculatum, and it's a poison that uh, was powdered. I don't know what they used it for, but it will kill animals and it will kill people. And I had to look the label up. There's nothing in it, fortunately, or maybe unfortunately. Um, but I looked the label up and it's so wonderful when you go on the web today, you can find anything. And I found, I looked up New Lebanon, New York, and it turns out, because I recognize New Lebanon as being a Shaker community, this was made along with rose water and rose hips and a lot of herbs. This was made by the Shakers in uh, New Lebanon, New York. And this little label here uh, is for sale, advertising rose water for $75. So I think to have um, intact the label um, in a screw top wooden container, original container, and they have it a poison, which is always interesting. I think this turns out to be probably a special little piece. Uh, these are probably the most special items on the table. These were made, some leather, but mostly wood, all hand carved, but they're snuff boxes that were made uh, it's mostly by sailors who had all the time in the world, so you've got bone on the top. So they carved them. While they carved them, the yep. and, and you know, they're famous for doing miniature work, like the, um, uh, like the scrimshaw that they do. Well, this is another one of the items. And look at the fingers on that. It's just beautifully done. The fingers are like the joints. The joints, yes. So it isn't just a joint together. It's, it's fingers that is made decoratively, like the shaker boxes. These fingers are decorative. These are all finished works of art turned on a lathe with a lot of time put into them. Um, and some hand carved. There's a hand carved one uh, that holds um, 
shot for a gun, for example. So not only were they commercial, but they were, I also have some that were done by hand uh, by people um, for themselves. My favorite is the wood planes. It's my favorite collection for what's it? Since uh, well, part of part of the collection, like this box right here, uh, was my father's. So about two thirds of the planes that are in that box were his originally, and and one or two of the others too. So that sort of started my interest in tool collecting. But uh, uh, this was found in a clean out. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I buy, sell, and uh, collect and restore antique tools. And this was in with a pile of tools that I went in and uh, to, to clean out, and this was in there. Um, it's kind of an interesting plane because back in the day, in the 1700s, I mean, they just kept using things over and over and over again. So originally, this little plane probably started about this size. So you can tell how much shorter it is. And at, at, at one time, you had probably some kind of a profile that it molded, but then the profile wore out, and instead of throwing the plane away, they, they made a rabbit plane out of it so they could continue to use it. Of course, it has uh, Caesar Cheller's name on the front as the maker, so that, that's kind of special. Well. When I, when I first did, I didn't realize that he had been a slave. I was aware of the name and I did the research after uh, and discovered that he had been a slave uh, and had learned, learned as a slave the, 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 the uh, trade of plane making. So that's kind of, that's, that's kind of, I mean, every one of these sort of has a story and they're all, some of them are pretty rare and some aren't. Like Caesar Cheller is not necessarily a rare plane but the fact that he was a slave makes that plane to collectors very interesting. So because of that, if I was to go on eBay or go to an auction, I would expect to pay quite a bit of money for a problem, maybe over $1,000 for a plane of his. So it has uh, that provenance. It has that provenance. Yes. yes. There, yeah, there, there are three or four uh, people who started out as slaves that became well-known plane makers, and he's one of them. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all the other planes have a purpose. Uh, back in the day, before they uh, had planers to plane the wood, they had to do it all by hand, and these planes would be used for that. These planes over here um, would be used for making the, the wood smooth. This plane here it was made by a person by the name of Uriah Clapp, and he was from Gardner, Massachusetts. He was a cabinet maker, but he also made his own planes. This on quantity is far more rare to have a plane by him, him by, than Caesar. There's only, uh, there, there are less than 50 examples known to exist of his planes. Barbara is very special here today because she's a 1955 graduate of Templeton High School. And uh, she even has her class ring, which says 55, and her uh, class uh, annual. Pendant. Pen her class pendant. Back then they had a pendant, mm -hmm. a ring, and the, the, the yearbook, or the annual. Yes, and I still have the tr things from our class trip from Washington, D.C. that I never opened at home. Oh, now, yeah. did you go to Washington? I've read that we some went, classes didn't graduate, didn't hold a, a commencement, but we didn't, they went to Washington. We didn't go until our senior year, and we had to raise all the money to go to that trip, too. Wow. And we did by selling Christmas cards and everything else, and people got sick of hearing from me because I was on the committee. <laughs> but we needed the money. <laughs> How many in your class? 51. 51, and you all raised enough money to go to Washington? Yes, we did. And what was the highlight for you? Uh, my, one of my highlights was seeing Lincoln. It impressed me tr tremendously at that time. I remember looking at that statue of him for the longest time. I have things from Germany. I lived in Germany for two years, 1956 to 1958. My daughter was born while we were there. Did you work there or was your husband? Uh, my husband was military, paratrooper. And that carving set, the handles are made of deer horn. And I have a set of china also from there, but you know, I didn't bring any with me. Um, I have my grandmother's, she came here from Finland 
Hilma Wilhelmina Seppelin at age 17, and all she brought with her was a tea, teapot, cup of teapot and a suitcase. And they didn't speak the language, they had to learn it here, and uh, they had to do everything the hard way. And this book I put together of her crocheting work through all the years. And I say that I have some pieces. She died in 1955. She lived at the Templeton Inn for a little while before she passed away. So, yeah, along with my Aunt Ingrid, her daughter. My mother was a daughter, too. And I have pieces from the 1800s of my grandmother's hair pieces and belt buckles and jewelry that she had. Can you hold up these? Uh, these Can I what? They're, they're made from human hair, yes. right? Yes, yeah, they're human hair. And I don't know how they ever did you it. stick them into your hair. Yeah, into your, uh, they stuck them into their regular hair. They would hang down. Yeah. Yeah, so I had that. And the jewelry that, this came from England. And uh, my, my uncle sent it to my grandmother back in 1927, which is 10 years before I was born. And this is also made, this bracelet is also made and from England, made out of the English money at the time. And I believe it's silver. And this book came from Finland. And it's got my marriage and so, and so forth in that as well. I have her wedding ring on, which you don't see anymore, which is engraved from 1903. So. Other than that, I have a picture of them. She was four feet ten, and he was five feet one. He came from Finland at age 18 alone with just one suitcase, too. He worked at Simon Saar and Steel for years. Is that Simon Saar and Steel in Fitchburg. And years later, my brother, who is now 81, worked there, too. Now, were, were you born in Simpson? I was born in Gardner, but I lived in East Templeton as a child. I went to East Templeton Grammar School. Uh, I used to be patrol leader in the eighth grade. We had Clara Hobbs for a teacher, and Robert Manning was a... We had combined rooms then, two fifth and sixth grade together and seventh and eighth grade together back then. I've written some of that down uh, on paperwork that I'm working on now from memories from back then when I grew up. I have pictures of the East Templeton Methodist Church Choir and that other booklet over there, and grammar school pictures from uh, fourth grade on up. And the names are on everything. You, you are wonderful. Bet. You are wonderful, Barbara. It's so important, so many old photos that they're not identified, but you and, and even your uncle, right? Yeah. Have taken the time and yeah. identified the photos. And he did that way before I was born. And there's a 20-year age span between the oldest Nash boy and the youngest Nash boy. My father was the youngest of the nine.